Well, thank you, Heinz. Did he call me a pioneer? I'm not sure I go for that name. <clears throat> but anyway, thank you folks for coming out tonight. I know you've all had a busy day, and we'll try to make this time uh, worthwhile and lively for you as well. Uh, let me say thanks to Cornerstone Church for uh, letting us share tonight. We really appreciate uh, 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 being here. Yeah, let me say hello from Indiana. Some of you have been through there. I flew in yesterday from there. I'm still part-time at Grace College in the northern part of the state. I left home there, my wife and our three grown daughters and grandkids and all that, and be heading back there in a, in a few days as well. Always kind of fun to visit here in the, in the northwest. So for this evening, for a little while, we're going to talk about the Bible and science. What do you think? Do you like science? You know, it all depends on what kind of teacher you had, whether they uh, were positive and refreshing or uh, went in the other direction. <clears throat> but the more I think about it, we've got the best reason for um, studying nature and enjoying it because we know who put it all together. And the more we know about this wonderful creation, I think the more we can appreciate life as well. So anyway, just to narrow this down for tonight, we're going to just um, talk about one area, and that will be space. So we've just got a few minutes here tonight to cover the universe. And I think we can do it. We'll make our, our best shot at it. And so we kind of titled this um, Some Lessons from Space. Uh, no quizzes, you know, no tests, so we can just kind of enjoy this together. And just to show you where I'm going, let me tell you what these lessons are, and then I'll explain them further. I have five ideas that uh, we will uh, kind of cover tonight. First of all, what have we learned after this whole space age that we've all grown up in? All these rockets and satellites, have we gotten our money's worth? What have we really learned from a creation perspective? So here they are. Number one, we have learned that the earth stands alone, that we are special. We're not the biggest planet. In fact, we're the third one in the solar system, but there's something unique and special about this planet that God gave us. And the next lesson is that biblical creation still holds, and it makes good sense. I know it's been around a long time, creation, ever since Genesis, but it's not outdated, and it's good science, and we'll take a look at that. Uh, the next lesson is that this universe operates with consistent, constant laws of nature. Some of you studied those back in the school days, and we won't get into all the technicalities, but it operates by laws which God set up and he enforces. And then that next lesson, this just involves distances. That space appears to just go on and on. It appears endless. Every year, new telescopes look further and further. Lessons from space. And the last one is that the whole place is running down. It didn't start by itself, and it doesn't last forever. And, uh, you know, someday the Lord's going to set up a new heavens, a new earth, because it's going to need it, because this one is uh, going down slow but sure. So anyway, we'll take a look at these um, five lessons and uh, see what we can do with them. I thought it might be good to start tonight with just some questions for you, just to kind of get us thinking about space. So um, first of all, um, do we know the difference between astronomy and astrology? People really confuse these two words. So you can see the one that I've crossed out there. We are not doing astrology tonight. I mean, if that would get back to my president back at Grace College, he would say, what are you doing? No, that's an area, astrology, that involves fortune telling, horoscopes, the idea that the stars control us, and it's all this nonsense. So we are going to stick with astronomy which is a good, wholesome study of this creation in the skies above. So just to keep that straight, maybe if the, you confuse those words, think that astrology has the L in it for like lucky stars or something like that, but that's not our business tonight. Well, let me just ask you a few quick um, thoughts here just to get us thinking. What is this object? Now, if you've been around for a while, you might recognize it. Looks like a basketball, doesn't it? You got it, what it is? Because I'll give you the answer here. It's the first satellite 66 years ago already, this whole space age that we live in. So this was Sputnik. 
the Russians put it up, they beat us into space. Then we got up there a year or two later and the space race was on and we kind of won that race. So that satellite kind of gave rise to uh, the beginning of the space age we live in, little Sputnik. It didn't last all that long. All of our man-made satellites, sooner or later, they slow down, they burn up as they fall back through the atmosphere. Okay, here's my next mystery question for you. What is this? Looks like some big rig. This thing passes right across Washington once in a while, and uh, you can look up when it's coming by, and then you can watch it at night. Uh, this is the International Space Station, and there's usually about six people on board. It's one of these Earth satellites. goes around the world in about two hours, and um, it looks as it goes through the sky like an airplane, but it doesn't blink. It's reflecting the sun, so it's kind of a shiny, just like a like a plane, and it just moves slowly across the sky. It's something to, to kind of watch for, kind of fun to see that. A lot of technology. I don't know what they're doing up there on the space station, but they seem to come and go. Okay, here's my third unknown thing. What might this be? I know it kind of looks like a cheese pizza or something like that. Well, in our solar system, there are a lot of objects, and this is one of the moons of Jupiter called Io or Io. Uh, Jupiter has dozens and dozens of moons, and this is an interesting one. Now, this is something that circles Jupiter, and it uh, gets this color because it's coated with sulfur. In fact, it's very hot, and there are lakes of burning brimstone, molten sulfur on this moon. Sounds kind of biblical, like it's an object lesson up there. Uh, I don't think I care to go there at all. Actually, I like our moon a lot better than Eo, but there's some great variety in space. So anyway, uh, let's go on, and we had our first lesson that shows that the Earth is special, so I'll just kind of say that again here. And uh, to think about this, let's look around the neighborhood a little bit to see um, if anything compares with planet Earth. And maybe our first stop could be our nearest neighbor in space, the moon. Now, uh, it's smaller than the Earth, circles the Earth about once a month. And, uh, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, we went to the moon. And kids, we did go to the moon. There are people that are trying to confuse us that the whole thing was kind of a conspiracy, but actually uh, tens of thousands of men and women engineers made this possible in the U.S., and a lot of instruments were left on the moon that are still being monitored. Who's trying to re rewrite history and say that we didn't go? Anyway, we did. Well, what did we find out that the moon is like? It's not like the Earth at all. Of course, there's no air to breathe. There's no liquid water. There's no clouds, no blue sky, no rain. There's no weather at all. The moon is like an unchanging museum. It just is there. It's not like the Earth. Now, on the moon, uh, during the day when the sun comes out, the temperature jumps right up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't think we could handle that. The astronauts could because they had reflective suits on and they had air conditioners on their back. When the sun goes down on the moon, <clears throat> then the temperature plunges to minus 200 degrees. Plus 200 minus 200. It's kind of a crazy place. You can visit there, but it'd be hard to live there. <clears throat> and by the way, that would also happen on the Earth, that rapid change in temperature, except for the Pacific Ocean and all the water on planet Earth. It soaks up the extra heat during the day <clears throat> in the water, and it gives off that heat at night. And so that's why we can live on the Earth. <clears throat> Since the moon has no liquid water, that's where the temperature changes so drastically. I'm looking around <clears throat> the neighborhood here. How about the planet that comes the closest to us? Now this would be the planet Venus. It's actually our twin in size, and although every day is cloudy on Venus, like that picture on the left shows. And as we have uh, studied Venus more closely, we have found out that when you get a little closer to the sun, where Venus is, it really gets warm. And the temperature there is 900 degrees Fahrenheit. All day, all night, all year, it never changes. 900. It has what's called a runaway greenhouse effect. We have not sent anyone to Venus. 
<laughs> you could not survive. <clears throat> In fact, the probes that we send there only last for some minutes, and then they melt and quit. It's a crazy place. Why did God make these other strange planets so we can appreciate planet Earth all the more? If you go further out from the, the sun, we've got Mercury, Venus, Earth. This would be Mars. Now, Mars is interesting. It does have some markings on it. Looks like it's got a big Grand Canyon on it. But when you get closer or further from the sun, then it gets cold in a hurry. And on uh, Mars, the temperature often drops to minus 200 degrees. You know, I think that God has put planet Earth in just the right place. We're neither too close to the sun, so we'd burn, or too far from the sun that we'd freeze. We are the third planet right where we should be. And uh, God knew what he was doing when he set all this up. <clears throat> uh, Mars has uh, not enough air to breathe. It has no liquid water. And uh, we may go to Mars over the next few decades with astronauts, but <clears throat> I'm sure it'll only be for a visit. So I'm still looking around our neighborhood to see if there's any place like Earth, and so far not with the with moon or uh, Venus or Mars. We've sent lots of probes to Mars. In fact, this picture shows one of these probes, and uh, this is tax money. We've sent dozens of things there. Why do we keep going to Mars with these robotic-type craft? What are we looking for? Martians. <laughs> There's this assumption, you know, that life should evolve if you have enough time, and so they think maybe it's happened elsewhere, and uh, they look on Mars, and we have not found anything at all. It looks more and more like life is special right here on planet Earth. By the way, if we do eventually find some microbes on Mars, we probably put them there, because with these dozens of probes, we might have carried some kind of microbial life there, but it's not happened on its own because things just don't evolve. Life always comes from other life. I'm kind of reaching out to the end of our solar system now. So here's uh, Jupiter. That's an interesting planet. <clears throat> it's 10 times larger than planet Earth, and it's all gaseous, as this picture shows. If you go to Jupiter, you'd fall right into it. It's not solid, and those are poisonous gases. So uh, interesting place to look at, but you can't live there. By the way, these fall evenings, if you look in the east, about 9 or 10 p.m., you'll see Jupiter. It's very bright. It's in the evening eastern sky. You might look for it. It's our uh, planet for the fall. Well, there's other large planets in the outer part of the solar system, and it's going to be cold and dark out there. Here's one of our favorite ones, of course, Saturn with its beautiful rings, also with uh, some poisonous gases on it and uh, uh, no place to stand. By the way, these outer planets are kind of impressive when you think about their size. This shows Saturn compared with planet Earth. It just dwarfs us. But of course, we still have the favorite planet. But anyway, those are large out there. And as I finish this up, we don't have to talk about all the planets, but I can't leave out Pluto. You know, aren't we still sticking up for Pluto? They kind of demoted it and call it a subplanet, but I think they're going to reverse that because it's out there, and it is the smallest one out there in the fringe of the solar system, and round and round it goes. And out there, by the way, the temperature is like minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit, but it's something that God made, and it's out there where it's cold and dark. We never knew a lot about um, Pluto until uh, just a few years ago when uh, a probe finally got out there, this is billions of miles, and sent this picture back to Earth. However they do that, however they can send pictures by way of uh, radio waves. And uh, it was interesting to see that Pluto has activity on it. There's apparently been some volcanic activity and uh, there are craters. So even out there, things happen, things we had never seen before. God's got his secrets all through the universe, and maybe the angels enjoy some of that dynamics, and once in a while, we catch a glimpse of it. So anyway, this picture is uh, the only one we have of Pluto, and uh, that area on the lower part there that's kind of uh, lightish, those are snow fields. Not water-type snow, but other chemicals. Snow is just any kind of frozen gas. And I was looking at this picture, and there's almost kind of a shape there. So for a little imagination, I was thinking on Pluto, there's sort of a Valentine's heart. It looked to have that shape to me, God's wonderful variety that he's put all around us in space. 
Well, now, there's a lot of uh, research going on looking for other planets, not in our own solar system, but objects going around other stars. And uh, we have come up with over 4,000 new planets. They don't have names, but they're going around their mother stars. And so here's just a picture of a whole bunch of planets. And uh, none, of them, none of them look like the Earth. They're either too close to their star where it's hot, or they're too far away where it's cold. It just kind of shows us the special attention that was given to planet Earth. In fact, I was kind of putting a composite together of all these new planets that they're finding. They have poisonous gases. They have crushing air pressure. They have everything you don't want. Planet Earth is special in every way that's made this home for us. Now, someone still says space is so huge and you got all these other objects, there must be aliens out there. What do you think? Are there aliens? All I can tell you is after a whole lifetime that we've all lived through with this space age, there is not a shred of evidence for life anywhere else. It makes it all the more precious here on planet Earth. Now, I know there are unidentified things, the UFO type stuff, but I think a lot of that is phenomena in our own atmosphere, things that we don't understand very well. So anyway, when it comes to life in space, at least at this stage of life, I'm going to give it a no. And I think that's backed up by Scripture. Psalm 115 says, The earth God gave to man, but the heavens belong to God, not to aliens. My goodness. So, um, the search goes on. Now, the Bible doesn't say a lot more about that, and God may have his secrets on life elsewhere, but everything that we look at seems to show that life is very unique. And there's the verse that backs this up as well. God gave special time to the earth. He made it to be inhabited. We know that the Lord Jesus walked here. Of all places in the universe, the earth stands out in lots of ways. So anyway, that's lesson one that the uh, Another way to say it, there's no place like home. I know we get rain and sometimes we get funny things here on earth, but uh, we do stand out in every place that we've possibly looked at. So our next lesson, remember we have five of them, would be biblical creation. How it all started in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 makes good sense. It's not outdated, and it's such a refreshing contrast to much of what secular science says. So this involves this question, this thing called the Big Bang that we've all grown up with. You hear about this on the television specials, the nature programs, National Geographic magazine, every place you look, they talk about the Big Bang theory. Now that theory that says that long ago, about 14 billion years ago, the whole universe was all one little nugget. They call it a kernel. And there wasn't anything outside of it. That's all there was, although I can't imagine that. And then one day it became unstable, and it's just started to expand and spread outward in all directions. What triggered that, the experts don't know. But as that material expanded, it slowly cooled, and first of all, stars formed, and then planets, and then people, and here we are. It's quite a story, isn't it? Now, there are problems with the Big Bang Theory. In fact, I would predict that it's going to go away one of these years. I've watched this stuff for a while. Before the Big Bang, we had what was called the Steady State Theory. Now we have the Big Bang Theory. I'm not sure what the next one's going to be called. But all of these natural origin theories, they just come and go. I think we can do better than that. And if we turn to scripture, Psalm 33, 9, this talks about the real creation. God spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. That does not sound like some slow, gradual, big bang expansion. It was supernatural. It happened quickly. I guess we could say that God spoke and bang, there it was, but it's not the typical big bang theory at all. I put another phrase at the bottom of this slide that you can see. There's a little bit of Latin there, which says ex nihilo. Do we know what that stands for? It means nada. It means from nothing. When God creates, it's the work of his fingers. His word could speak worlds into existence. Now, some of you folks are creative. You can do uh, landscaping, 
or photography, all these different areas. But whenever we do that, you know, we are using beginning materials. When God creates, he doesn't need any starting materials. So in a real sense, only God actually does create. So that's his whole realm. Biblical creation makes good sense. Now, it is interesting that as we look at space, it appears that the universe is getting larger, that it is, that it is expanding. You heard this idea that things are spreading out? Not that um, you have to walk further to get to school or work. That's not spreading out. And even the solar system is very stable. But in deep space, the faraway stars and galaxies seem to be speeding away from us. All of the universe seems to be expanding. Here, I try to just draw a quick picture of it. And uh, this seems to be true. And you see, sometimes this is taken as an evidence for the Big Bang. Remember, it started small and got larger, so that would kind of fit this idea. Well, as you already know, I don't care for the Big Bang Theory. I would suggest that when God made the universe, especially on day number four, when he made the sun, moon, and stars, he made the universe large and getting larger. He created the universe in an, in an expanding situation with this kind of motion. And I think there's a reason why God made the universe this way, that it is expanding. What if God would just park the galaxies and the stars like sitting still in the sky, like just static? If they weren't moving, then gravity would take over and everything would start to fall in toward the center and uh, the universe would collapse. We would have the big crunch, I guess. No, you need to have these kind of outward motions for a stable, dependable universe. There's all kinds of motions going on. Did you know that right now we are traveling faster than a bullet? You say, I am not. I'm sitting here in this seat. <laughs> well, it's a good thing we don't notice that. But uh, we are on the earth, and the earth is circling the sun, and we better keep moving or we would fall into the sun. We need to have our orbiting speed. And likewise, the sun is carrying us along as it goes around the galaxy. There are motions within motions, and thankfully we don't notice that because the clouds, the birds, the trees, they all go right with us as we move through space. But all these motions are necessary for a stable earth. So anyway, that's just that little thought on an expanding universe. And I think, once again, this can be backed up with Scripture. Isaiah 42.5 is talking about the creation account. And it says, God created the heavens and stretched them out. And they are still stretching outward. How interesting that all is. Let me just give you a, a bit here of um, current events. Uh, we are looking far out in the deep space these days where things are really stretched out. And um, there's a new telescope that was just put up last year. It's called the James Webb Telescope. You, you would have, might have seen that in your newspaper. And uh, this new instrument, there's nobody on board. It's a remote telescope. It's as big as a tennis court. And it's a million miles out there, so that's way beyond the moon. And this thing is looking into deep space. That's one of the pictures that is taken on the right. And uh, they've never looked at this far away before. I mean, way out to the depths of space. And what are they finding? Again, just with some current events. The assumption was when, that, when they look way out there, they would see remnants of what was left from the Big Bang, that they would just see some dust, or just some particles before anything had come together. But what this telescope is showing, as far as we can look, we see fully grown adult galaxies. Now, I've been using that word. Those are those spirals, those kind of whirlpools of stars. And that's what this is showing. As far as we look, fully formed galaxies, which shows us that biblical creation, when God started, he didn't start small. He didn't start with a big bang that had to slowly develop. He started with a whole universe that looks much like it does today with fully formed star systems way out in the depths of space. Astronomers aren't sure what to do about this, but it's going to be part of the downfall of that big bang theory. Well, I'm talking about biblical creation making good sense. That was just too much talking about the whole universe. Let me bring this closer to home. 
what else do we know about the origin of? How about our nearest neighbor in space, the moon? We brought him up a few minutes ago. Have we figured out how that moon got to be circling the Earth? We're talking about origins here now. That was our second lesson. Well, over the years, there's been different ideas of how that moon got to be. Round and round the Earth it goes. And it's interesting to see what the history of this is. Now, back um, a few decades ago in the 1960s, this was the theory that was in all the books. It was said, what happened is that a long time ago, the Earth was spinning very rapidly, and a lot of mud kind of broke off from it, fissioned off, and became the moon. Now, this is a strange picture you're looking at. Is that, what is that, a bowling pin? <laughs> is that a, chick, a turkey drumstick? What is this? Well, this was a serious theory, the fission theory, that the moon had broken off from the Earth, and uh, this is the best they could do. Now, I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense because the Earth doesn't turn that fast, thankfully, that things don't go flinging off, but that was the idea. This theory went away in 1969. What do you think happened that year? Neil Armstrong walked on the moon with several others, and they collected moon rocks and brought them back to Earth. And as we study them, moon rocks do not look like Earth rocks. You see, if this had happened, they'd be identical, like it came from here, but it looks like it came from elsewhere. So the fission theory went away. So in the 1970s, the next idea that came along was called the capture theory. The suggestion was that long ago, the moon just came from somewhere else. How do you like that? And it approached the Earth and got caught up in our gravity, and uh, we captured it, and it's been going around us ever since. It's not really a good origin theory, but we'll give them that one. However, there's always a problem. If a moon would come close to planet Earth like this picture shows, it would definitely feel our gravity, and it would go spinning around in that outer loop. But you know what would happen after about half of a turn? Here, I put in another arrow here that moon would be gone. It would actually pick up speed. It'd be like a stone out of a slingshot. To capture the moon, you would have to slow it down, put on the brakes, carefully insert it into orbit. And how do you do that with these spontaneous origin theories? So capture went away. So the next decade that came along was called the nebula theory. I'm glad there's no quiz over this stuff. But anyway, I've watched this as the decades go by, and these natural origin theories roll on past, and never, none of them last too long. The trouble with this one, we do have nebula or gas clouds in space, but they're all spreading out. They're dissipating. They're not coming together to make moons and Earth so much for that one. Hey, let me just kind of jump to the end here and give you the latest idea. If you would Google this origin of the moon, the current view is that something crashed into the Earth. It's called the collision theory. It's called giant impact. And so here's kind of an artist's drawing of this big rock hitting the Earth, and it hit the Earth so hard that it fractured the Earth, and a bunch of that material flew up into the sky and then kind of came together and formed the moon. They don't have all the details figured out yet, but uh, there it is. And uh, it doesn't work either. You know, our Creator, our Lord, did not set up this Earth that is going to get clobbered by something like this that breaks the Earth in half. He's got his own plans for the future of this Earth. So much for collision. So anyway, uh, here's a quick summary. Fission, capture, nebula, collision, another one will be coming. We cannot figure out naturally how that moon got in the sky, and yet there it is. Now, astronomers, you know, like to talk about the origin of planets and galaxies, and they haven't even gotten the first base to explain the moon. I think some humility is in order by the astronomy world. And as I look at this list, I just uh, want to, you know, humbly suggest, along with you folks, maybe the moon cannot be explained. Maybe somebody put it there. In other words, that it's part of this biblical creation story. And that's why we have that moon and why it defies all the origin theories. And one thing that I really like about the creation viewpoint, as soon as you take that position, then there's reasons. These things don't happen by chance, but there's purpose. So I start to wonder, the moon, 
Why did God put that in the sky? Would you miss the moon if it wasn't there? Does it do anything for you? <laughs> now, really, I know they make songs about the moon and poetry. Well, the more you think about the moon, it does serve lots of purposes for us. And as you might guess, I've started a list. So um, here's a partial list of what the moon does. Of course, it's a nightlight. I was giving a talk somewhere, and I had a skeptic who said, we don't need that nightlight, we've got flashlights. And I said, thank you, sir, but for a lot of people in this world, moonlight is still important, and it certainly has been all through history. It is a faithful nightlight. Some nights a full moon, some nights a first quarter moon, on it goes. And then I have some C words there. If you get familiar with moon phases, like, you know, the crescent moon, you can tell time by the moon, and you can tell um, the season, and you can tell directions. The moon is covered with craters, and here it is right next door to us. So if those objects, those meteorites, were not striking the moon, they would hit us. So the moon also protects us from some of these um, smaller objects that do impact the Earth. We have learned in just the last 20 years that the moon is why we have our seasons. Now remember uh, in the classroom how an Earth globe is tilted 23 and a half degrees, and that's what gives us our seasons? If we didn't have the moon, the Earth would wobble and its axis would move around, and we might go from winter to deeper winter. That might not affect you, but it would us back in Indiana. And uh, the moon stabilizes our Earth so that we have our faithful seasons. Thank you, Lord, for that moon in the sky. And the list goes on. There's the tides. You guys are more familiar with that than we are back in the Midwest. But the tides do something very important for us. Now, of course, uh, we don't understand that completely, that they're caused by the gravity of the moon pulling on the water, and back and forth the water goes, high tides and low tides. It helps keep the oceans healthy. It's a major part of the ocean currents. Now, in the ocean, there's lots of life. Of course, all the fish. And there are also, aren't there plants in the ocean? Lots of them. You have the floating type plants, it's called the grass of the seas, and you have kelp forests in the shallow areas. And we all recall that plants breathe the opposite of us. They take in carbon dioxide and they give off oxygen. That's why plants are important. Current estimates are that the plants in the ocean provide half of our oxygen. So what if there was no moon? Well, then there'll be no tides. Well, there goes a major part of the ocean currents. The ocean will become stagnant, and the plants will die. Well, there goes the air. There goes us. Our very breath depends on that moon keeping the oceans in circulation. It's just, I have this list on the screen, and I wonder if there are maybe 20 more things that we haven't even thought of that the moon uh, does for us. Even in a world that's far from perfect, we can see how this has been set up for our well-being and for our, our survival. So anyway, lesson one was Earth is special. This is lesson number two, that a biblical creation makes good sense, whether you're talking about um, the whole universe or whether you're just talking about the moon. And uh, so there it is again, and uh, it's time to move on. So we're up to lesson number three. Remember we got five of them all together? The universe operates by constant, consistent physical laws. And this is what you really get into in your uh, science classes as well. And there are laws of thermodynamics and laws of chemistry in different areas. Let me just mention one law here, gravity. I had to spit in one formula tonight. So uh, here it is, you know, this goes back to Isaac Newton. Gravity is this mysterious invisible force that says all objects attract each other and hold together. So this holds us on the ground. It uh, keeps uh, the earth from uh, getting away from the sun, and it keeps the moon going around the earth and all the other parts as well. And if you want the formula, there it is. F is a force, big G is the gravity constant. The M and M's would be just two objects, earth and moon, and the distance squared is on the bottom. Anyway, it's a neat rule. I believe that God established this law and I think he upholds it and keeps it operating because laws don't enforce themselves. You know, I must say, um, my training, I went to uh, Iowa State, 
and I uh, took all the science courses and we really studied this kind of stuff and there are pages and pages of the mathematics that go with this formula. And I listened to all of the professors and I read all of the books. Never was I confronted with anyone who talked about where these laws came from. They explained them upside down, forward and backward, but these laws of nature, they don't know where they came from. They just assume they're there. I think we know. I think it's part of the creation week when God put them all in place at the beginning. The laws of nature, a great testimony, a witness to a biblical creation. You know, one thing about gravity and all these other laws, it's so dependable and you can predict what's going to happen in the future if things continue. So one area that uh, can be precisely uh, calc calculated and predicted would be eclipses. Isn't it interesting that the sun and the moon appear about the same size in the sky? You've noticed that? How big are they, like a quarter? Why do they look like they're the same size? You know, because of that, they can kind of cover each other once in a while. I mean, the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, but it's also 400 times closer than the sun. So it's a perfect match. And once in a while, one can move in front of the other. This is a picture of a moon eclipse when the moon moves to the Earth's shadow and it kind of uh, gets that reddish brown color. And uh, these um, months, um, solar eclipses have been in the news. You had one recently up here in the, in the Northwest, at least a partial eclipse. But uh, back uh, in the Midwest, we are looking forward to about six months from now when there's gonna be a total eclipse of the sun and it's gonna go right through Indiana. Now, it won't go through um, uh, the northwest here, and this is its path <clears throat> uh, right across the country. So this is next April. These are kind of rare, and uh, we're looking forward to that. We hope that it's uh, not rainy that day, because that would get in the way. But anyway, that's gonna be kind of a holiday across the country. Those moon eclipses occur now and then, but these total solar eclipses are more unusual. What happens is it gets dark in the middle of the day for about four minutes and the stars come out and the birds get very confused <laughs> because they settle down and then the sun pops out again. So anyway, that's kind of uh, something that we are really looking forward to. And uh, there's that verse that just says, it, these laws of nature are so dependable, uh, uh, unless God changes things, it'll happen. By the way, the one that's gonna come the closest uh, here in the Northwest is about 20 years from now. Oh, it's not hitting Washington, but it's just south of you. So these are that rare that this will be the next one in your vicinity. So that's 2045. Can we hang on that long maybe to watch that one? Looks like you'd have to travel south a little bit, but that'll be another total eclipse. And then there won't be another one for like 99 years. I mean, in this area, these are quite rare. And uh, so interesting that to the exact minute they know when these things are coming, following the rules that God established for his world. Hey, I'm talking about the laws of nature. I don't know how interesting this is, but uh, let me get more general for a minute. What are the two most basic laws in all of nature? Whether you're talking chemistry or geology or, or weather or whatever, there are two very basic laws. I think you probably ran into these back in middle school. They both involve energy. Here's the first one. Energy is conserved. It is constant. Energy can take lots of different forms, light, heat, sound, motion, but there's a certain amount of energy and you can't create it and you can't make it go away. It's kind of like this auditorium when they heat this place, when the, when the weather goes cooler, what happens to that heat energy? It goes through the windows, through the walls and you can't get it back. It just goes into the air. It's around, but it's just not available. So anyway, that's this um, conservation of energy and it makes science dependable. There's a certain amount of energy in an apple or in a gallon of gasoline and we can calculate this kind of thing. So anyway, that's that first basic law. Okay, you good with that one? No, some of you are shaking your head no. You're saying, I'm sorry, this law does not work for me. I had some energy this morning and it's gone. <laughs> what do you mean energy is constant, it's conserved? Well, I'm glad you asked because that brings up the second most basic law of nature that energy kind of gets away from us 
and it becomes unavailable. And uh, this is the second law of thermal, it's called, the loss of energy. It's not really a very friendly law. It's, it means that energy is getting more expensive. Once you burn coal, you can't get that energy back again. It becomes unavailable. I like that first law, energy is constant. This one, this just says um, you got to work in life. And connected with the second law is even things wearing out and finally dying. Somehow this second law is attached to the fall, to the curse. I'm not sure how it's connected, but it is. In fact, these two basic laws are both theological. The first one is creation. Remember constant energy? God, during the creation week, inserted a certain amount of energy into this universe, and then it's been coasting ever since. And the second law just says, and that energy is kind of wearing down and becoming unavailable to us. So anyway, those two basic laws, and we'll move on here. Here's the verse that Matt also uh, just goes along with that third lesson. God's faithfulness, the laws that he's established, are on us on all sides. Lesson number four. This is the one that involved distances. Just because space is just so vast and amazing what we're finding out here. So uh, that's the way I just said it, that space appears to be endless. I really think it might be infinite. Could God make an infinite physical universe? I guess he can make whatever he wants, and that's what, uh, the way it appears to us. So anyway, let's take a quick little trip here to see what kind of uh, distances we have. This would be our first stop, the moon. So the moon is about a quarter million miles away. It took the astronauts like three days to get there on those Apollo rockets. Another way to say this, the moon is about 1.3 light seconds away. If you shine your flashlight at the moon, the light would get there just over one second later and nobody would see it because it would be so spread out. Next uh, at distances, let me just think about the sun, which is 93 million miles away. We're slowly moving out from the earth. Another way to say for the sun is that the sun is eight light minutes away. So if the sun would suddenly quit? What if it would burn out like a light bulb? We wouldn't even know it for about eight minutes. And then the last light would get here and it would get cold and dark in a hurry. Of course, that's not gonna happen. Our sun is very steady in its light. But anyway, that's the distance to the sun. When you wanna go further than that, then you start to run into big distances and you can't use miles anymore. So we talk about something called a light year. And you've heard this phrase, this is a kind of a yardstick that we use in space studies. A light year is the distance that light will travel during all of 2023 if it doesn't bump into anything. And it's six trillion miles, rounded off just a little bit. Uh, can't comprehend that number, it's just a huge number, but there it is, and we have those kind of distances in space. It's not a very good name, because light year, it sounds like a time, but it's a, a meter stick, it's a distance. So for the rest of our distances, we have to talk about light years, each one being six trillion miles. So uh, what's out that far? Well, how about some of the stars, the nighttime stars that we're familiar with? Remember the Big Dipper? You know, if God had put those lines in the sky, it'd be a lot easier to find it. So I just thought I would put them in there to kind of help. So there it is. Of course, this is in our northern sky. You might have to get away from some of the security lights to see it. But um, those Big Dipper stars, on the average, are about 100 light years away. Okay? So that light would have started out in uh, 1923. And if you had a clear sky tonight, you could go out and see that light, which would finally be getting here in 2023, 100 years later. Within reason, it does take time for this light to travel. Actually, there's more in this picture. There's also the Little Dipper, and that's harder to see. And that's actually in the northern sky as well, and kind of... Uh, uh, it's almost as big as the, the Big Dipper, and they kind of face each other. So that's another one to see, but you've really got to be in a dark sky to see the Little Dipper. There's more in this picture, so that's the northern sky. And also, while I'm looking at this picture, there's one special star. And it might be good to know it. It's the Pole Star, the North Star, Polaris. And uh, this arrow is pointing at it. And this is how you can find it. Locate the Big Dipper. 
go to the dip part and find those two pointer stars and just go out about several times their distance and you'll run into Polaris. It's not the brightest star, it's not the closest or the largest, but it's right above the north pole of the Earth. So it seems to sit still, it's like the center of the merry-go-round as the Earth turns and everything seems to go around it. So whenever you're lost in the big woods at night, if you can find the Big Dipper and find the North Star, that'll kind of help you find your direction. This has been very useful to a lot of people over the years. So yes, all of these stars are light years of distance, and uh, these constellations are kind of interesting. Now here's the flag of uh, Australia, it's very close to that of New Zealand as well, and they're proud of these little stars here called um, the Little Cross. And uh, you have to go down and go below the equator to see this thing. All right, there it is. And so they put it right on their flag as well. It's called the Southern Cross. And uh, I kind of uh, was highlighting it there. Kind of interesting that um, this symbol of, um, of the gospel, of the cross, is in our sky down below the equator. But you don't have to go way down there to see it because up here, right over Washington, right over North America, we have what's called the Northern Cross. And it looks like this, it's also Cygnus the Swan. And let me kind of highlight that um, cross as well. In both hemispheres, we have this um, constellation of a shape of a cross. And I don't think these stars have changed since creation. There's not been that time for anything to happen. It's almost like there's a gospel in the stars. And this might meant more to, uh, might have meant more in early days before people had scripture. Of course, we got the sure word now in, in, in the Bible. But perhaps in the early centuries, these stars in the sky were object lessons that kind of helped people understand how it was all put together. The Northern Cross, the Southern Cross. Now, if you want to go even further in the space, then you need to have these large telescopes. And they like to build these down in Arizona where the skies are often clear. And so uh, here's a whole, looks like a whole neighborhood full of these um, uh, telescopes. And when they take pictures, time exposures, they see things like this way out in space. Galaxies. Now this one's called Andromeda. Looks like there's a couple of small ones beyond it. Ours is called the Milky Way. <clears throat> it's not as easy to see ours because we're inside it. These galaxies are spread across space. There's lots of emptiness, and then there'll be a galaxy. They're like islands, as far as we can see, with emptiness between them. They're, they run out of names. There's even one that they call Snickers. I guess they're using candy bar names here just to kind of uh, identify these things. These are amazing, these whirlpools, these spirals of stars. Each one holds about 100 billion stars, and our, our sun, our Earth is just one little spot inside a galaxy, and ours probably looks very much like this picture. These are so majestic, and they're slowly rotating as everything is moving in space. <clears throat> it's all becoming overwhelming. Suddenly, we've gone off the deep end with these big numbers. It almost gives me a headache to think about it, but it's good to kind of keep this in mind just to keep the whole lists the whole order of things. So in case you're trying to keep track of things, remember the three letters MPG. It's like miles per gallon. But in this case, M is the moon. That's the closest thing to us. Next would come the planets or the solar system. That's our neighborhood. And then finally you have G, the galaxies. This is the hierarchy of space, starting at home and then moving outward. And on and on it goes. Okay, well, we've just got a few minutes left here, and I want to kind of keep us alert here, so I've got a question for you here to think about for just a minute. On the screen, I'm putting five objects. Can you sort them out from the nearest to us to the furthest away? Because we're talking distance. Which, of, which, has come the, which is the closest and which is the most distant? Can you turn to your neighbor for just about 20 seconds here and uh, see if you can sort these out? At least, get the, at least get the closest and the furthest, and then we'll reveal the answer. Try it a minute.
Okay, well, we got to move along here. Time's going on. <laughs> Sorry about that. You said, I didn't come here to take a quiz. What are you doing, DeYoung? <laughs> anyway, it's just kind of good to know uh, how, how this whole thing is set up for us. So uh, in the correct order, from near to far, it would look like this. Did you get some of them right? Now, a shooting star is not really a star because stars don't shoot. That is a pebble falling through our atmosphere, only maybe like 30 or 40 miles up. So that's close to home. Those are these um, meteors that kind of burn up. You see those once in a while. So that's the closest. The moon would be next, remember, quarter million miles. Then the sun, 93 million miles. Pluto is way out there on the edge of the solar system, so that would come next, billions of miles. And then those big dipper stars are the furthest of all. So there's the correct order. Give yourself full credit, whatever you came up with on that. Just kind of good to know how it all sorts out. Yeah, watch for those shooting stars. I still call them that as well, but those are smaller objects yeah, that you could hold right in your hand. <clears throat> so how many stars do we know about? As we take pictures of the night sky, nobody can count the stars, but we can do statistics and we can come up with, um, up with estimates. And so here is the number of known stars up through this year. It's the number one followed by 22 zeros. What does that mean? <laughs> and I'm sure next year that number will even get larger because every year new telescopes look further and further. This might just be the first drop in the bucket, but that's what we're up to right now, 10 billion trillion stars. Hey, what if we would divide those up? One for you, one for me, one for everybody on the planet. You would get over a trillion stars. We'd be rich. No, wait, they're not ours. They don't belong to us. They're in deep space. They belong to God. Hey, there's something else interesting about this number. Engineering type people, and I know we have some, several technical people here tonight, are good at making estimates. And you can make an estimate, thinking about planet Earth, of all the sand grains on all the seashores of the whole world around the edge of the Pacific Ocean, if there's some sandy beaches there, and around the Great Lakes where I live, and around inland lakes, the number of sand grains on all the seashores everywhere on Earth. If you do that kind of estimate, the number that you come up with is this same number, 10 to the 22 power. There are as many stars as there are sand grains, even the ones in your shoe if you've been walking on the beach lately. Uh, this is why I really like the fourth day of creation when God makes those stars. It just goes on and on. By the way, one of our books on the back table there kind of uh, proves the sand grains and the stars if you want to get into the techni technicalities of that. So anyway, that was lesson four, that the heavens declare God's, God's glory. How else can you say it? And our last lesson goes quick here, that everything is kind of wearing out. As we mentioned before, everything wears down. And even the stars are going away one by one. We don't see new stars forming. Frankly, it would take too long anyway. But every year we see stars dwindling and burning out. There are fewer stars in the sky tonight than when you were born. It's just the way it goes. Let me just show you one example of this. Um, we have this constellation. Some of you know this group of stars. It's over Washington in November, December. Starts with an O. This is Orion the Hunter. It's a wonderful constellation. Anyway, um, Underneath that belt, those three stars on a diagonal, there's a little uh, puff of light. And if you magnify it, it's called the Orion Nebula. It's a place where a star disintegrated. And this is what we see happening with some of these larger stars. They just, um, they go to pieces, and that's the end of them. They make <coughs> colorful pictures. And uh, <coughs> we do have hundreds of pictures like this. The cat's eye. Uh, here's <coughs> the Helix Nebula and uh, the Hourglass. They do make fascinating pictures, and yet it's kind of like walking through a cemetery. You're looking at grave markers where stars used to be, the Crab Nebula, and on and on these things go. 
And it's just a reminder, as Scripture tells us, that our present heavens are growing old. They're running down. They're waxing old like a garment, as King James says. So anyway, hey, we've taken our quick walk through uh, the universe. We've done what we could. Here's a quick summary. Planet Earth is special. That was our first lesson. I didn't even mention the water before. That makes us so unique and all the life that we have everywhere on the earth. Thank you, Lord, for that. And uh, the second uh, lesson was at uh, the beginning. Yes, biblical creation. It's not outdated, and it's so refreshing compared with all these temporary origin theories that uh, kind of come and go. And number three, the universe operates by design. It's a good thing that we don't have to control those laws of gravity and all those other rules, but God does. I think that if God would turn his back on this world for one instant, all the laws would cave in because they don't hold themselves, and we would have instant chaos. God's patient, isn't he? Keeping this whole thing running in spite of ourselves. And uh, lesson number five there again was that uh, everything is uh, uh, running out. So I just kind of said time is running out. And that's a good healthy reminder as well that the universe is not forever, but it's what's done for the Lord that's going to that's gonna last and in this life and in the life to come. Hey, we made it. We covered the whole universe here and wore ourselves out. We might just have a couple minutes if uh, anyone has a question, and uh, Heinz can help me with that. Now, I don't have all the answers. It's easy to stump me because we're all kind of learning this stuff together. But if you have a question or if you have any comments here, I'd be glad to listen. Do black holes serve a purpose in the universe? Black holes, do they serve a purpose? Well, black holes are collapsed stars. Some of those, um, some of those uh, nebula that we were looking at, you end up with sort of a compressed black hole in the center. So those are really dead stars. Those are stars that have used up their fuel and uh, they've just kind of fallen inward. Uh, you can't see them because they have so much gravity, even light can't escape. Purpose, I don't know, it's just kind of the end product. It's further evidence that the universe is decaying. I know some people have suggested that maybe the Lord uses black holes as kind of a reservoir to store energy. Well, I'm not sure that the Lord needs that. But anyway, that's the only suggestion I've heard. So uh, I don't know of any other purpose. You know, when you look at the universe, black holes are very exotic, and there are probably even things more strange that we haven't even found yet. We don't know a lot about deep space, and there's a lot of very peculiar objects out there. Large stars, small stars, black holes, pulsars, stars that blink off and on. So that's all I can say. It just shows God's infinite variety. shows that he's quite an artist to make things that are endless. That's the only answer I have. Thanks for asking. Yeah. If you have a question, put up your hand and I'll come around. Thank you, doctor. This is amazing. Look forward to tomorrow night's talk also. Um, along that same line, the nebula you're talking about, like Orion's belt and that part that is exploding, how long will that light last? How come it's not dissipating? Or when, how long did it take for us to see <laughs> that light? It would last for centuries and centuries. Um, <clears throat> That, that nebula is large, it's light years in size, and it's slowly spreading out. We can see slow changes over the decades, but it's just, it's, it's large, like everything is getting larger, but it, 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 it'll last actually for millennia. So it, everything's on a big scale. Yeah, it doesn't go poof and it's over with. It's just, everything is big. <laughs> Again, put up your hand if you have a question and I'll come around. Um, so one of the major, um, I, I guess you could say, uh, um, arguments against a young earth and, um, biblical creation is that, is that of light years from space uh, where, where did the light come from? It took too long to get here. So what would be your response to that? And, uh, how do we explain that from a biblical young earth perspective? Yeah, good question. <clears throat> um, we've been promoting the idea of a recent supernatural creation. 
and yet we have these stars that are millions of light years or billions of light years away. How can we see distant stars in a young universe? I mean, it's, it's a very basic question. It just doesn't seem like there's enough time for that light to get here yet. Well, creationists have come up with different approaches to this. How you can explain that we can see these faraway stars. Some of these explanations get very technical. Some of my friends, they talk about relativity and different clocks in space compared with the Earth. And I look at all of their ideas and I think none of them work. None of them impress me. I'm going to take the easy way out here. I think that on day number four, when God makes the heavens, he makes them with their stars and galaxies and constellations thoroughly spread out. So that he doesn't just make the stars and then that light has to trickle all the way across space to get here. He makes those objects with their light here. The whole idea of a creation that's fully functioning, that's mature, that's adult. And really, um, Adam and Eve, the very first evening, couldn't they go out and see the stars? I mean, that's the whole purpose of stars, to show God's glory. So they didn't have to wait for that starlight to get here. And likewise, when you think about the creation event in the Garden of Eden, you had small trees, you had large trees, you had soil, which probably looked like it had been there for a while. So I, I like this idea of a mature creation just to say that's the way God did it. Now, when you say that, that brings up other kinds of issues and problems. But, you know, whatever view anyone takes, there are unsolved problems. There's enough problems to go around, and so those are being worked on. So some of my friends get very technical with that, and uh, you can read those books. I always say that we're kidding ourselves when we try to take today's limited science knowledge to explain how God created. We're not about to do that because it's supernatural. So um, I... I don't know if that's an easy way out, but that's consistent in my view, just a mature creation. But thanks for asking. That, that question gets asked at every meeting, so uh, we're, we're used to dealing with that. Now, he'll, he'll take questions on other things that, in, you know, in creation or apologetics that you may have questions about. I see a, a hand back there, way back there. So put up your hand, and I'll come around. All right, um, I asked what would your opinion be on the possibility of the infinity of space? As in, do you think space has an end or does it go on forever? Because God created this world finite in terms of time, longevity. Do you think he created it finite or infinite in terms of volume? Or do you think space goes on forever or does it have an end? Thank you. Well, these are good questions for late on a Thursday night, aren't they? <laughs> Was creation made, is it finite or infinite? Again, when it comes to um, deep space, we do not see any end to it. It seems to go on and on with those fully functioning galaxies. So uh, in my mind, I would consider the idea that space even itself is physically infinite. Uh, I, God could do that. Now you say that time has a limit. Uh, of course, we, infinity is also part of our our spiritual lives, which is endless as well. So I think there's lots of things that are timeless and limitless in space that seems to be uh, consistent in, in my mind. So uh, yeah, I think things could well be infinite. You know, you can go the other direction. Remember atoms are made out of protons, electrons, and neutrons? Of course, that's all old stuff now. Those particles are made out of quarks. But no, those are made out of subquarks. But no, those are made out of it goes on forever in the microscopic scale. Infinite, there are different levels that we haven't even reached yet. So both the large and the small, it looks like it's endless. And uh, I mean, it just kind of shows you the majesty of the creator. I don't think he's got a stopping point where that's the end and there is no more. Now, thinking about space, there's other interesting uh, thoughts. We don't know a lot about deep space. And it may be that if you would take off and just start going through space on your spaceship, if you go far enough, you'd end up where you started. In other words, you're almost like going around in a circle, but space could have those kind of dimensions that there should be some kind of circularity to it. But then what's beyond that? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Other questions out there? 
there's always more to learn. Some of the things he's talking about here, when I started studying physics, I didn't know about either, but it, we keep on learning new stuff. Yeah, question back here. They're making me run. Where was I? How would you um, speak to a person that believes the earth is flat based on Job? and based on the biblical accounts and description of the beginning. How do you counter or consider the idea that the earth is flat? Oh my goodness. <laughs> By the way, I just drove through Nebraska. It looks pretty flat. <laughs> well, you know, there is a popular movement today. Some folks are saying that. It just seems like um, they don't want to believe anything that science says or the government says. And so there are geocentric people that the earth is the center of the universe and there are flat earthers. Uh, I'm not going to argue with them. I mean, the earth is certainly spherical, like everything else in the sky is, the sun, moon, planets, and stars. But uh, it's, it's, it's futile to try to counter that because whenever you come up with a reason why the earth is round, they'll come up with a, the other side will come up with a rebuttal and I've read their stuff. So um, it's just, <coughs> there's plenty of evidence that, that the earth is spherical and we can see that with, you know, things going over the horizon and everything else. But I just would kind of stay clear of that area. Thankfully, that's not a salvation issue. Even the age of the earth, I don't believe is a salvation issue, but uh, there are areas of being consistent and honoring the creator who made everything. So um, you know where that's coming from. There are some verses that talk about like the four corners of the earth that the angels will be at. But that's, you know, the, the Bible uses um, poetry and it uses those kind of pictures of things. There's just not evidence. There's not clear evidence in the Bible that the earth is flat. And so they just kind of gone off in that direction. Heinz, would you s have more to say about that, f the flat earth theory? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I, we've been asked that question a number of times in, in this church. We've had people come by and say, you know, they, we can prove that the earth is flat. Yeah. But uh, I've looked at that. I mean, some of the things, they, they make assumptions. For example, they assume that the law of gravity doesn't work. Well, the law of gravity doesn't work. I mean... You know, there a whole bunch of things don't work. But there are two, two good sources of information. One is a um, CMI, Rob Car Dr. Rob Carter, who has been here before. He's, uh, he's got uh, vo voluminous information on, his, uh, <coughs> on the CMI website refuting that idea. And at Answers in Genesis, there's um, um, the, the astronomer at uh, Answers in Genesis, he's got a book on that, on the flat earth, and that refutes all those ideas. And uh, I'm in the, actually, I, I bought that book. I'm in the middle of, of reading that because I have conversations going on on the web. People ask me questions about that, so I'm trying to get the latest answer. There are good answers to that question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, other questions? Kind of hard to see in the back corners there, but. I'm going to have a little difficulty getting into a question, I think. So we see artists' conceptions of, you know, creation and God's, uh, God said, let there be light. And there's, you know, light shooting out of the mouth of God, you know, at light speed. But if God is present everywhere and he says, let there be light, wouldn't there be light instantaneously everywhere? And does that affect then how we perceive light speed in that type of concept. Well, you're talking about light. <clears throat> of course, Scripture says that God is light, which in my mind means, you know, purity and, and truth and, and the word. Um, there is light everywhere. You know, there's more light than uh, meets the eye. Now, we have this visible light here coming out of these light bulbs, but there's a vast spectrum of light that we can't see. And you've heard of some of these. There's uh, radio waves, microwaves, TV waves. 
infrared, visible light, x-rays, gamma rays. This is the whole light spectrum. We see just a little window of it, but the rest of that light is everywhere all the time, so it is very thorough. And by the way, some of the animal world can see some kinds of light that we can't see. Bumblebees can see ultraviolet light. Snakes can see uh, infrared light. So in a way, uh, there is all kinds of light everywhere at all times, just like God is everywhere. But I want to be careful there because, you know, Satan, kind of like a lion that wanders around, he can be uh, uh, deceptive light himself. So you're kind of interfacing there, physical light with light being God. Uh, that's just, I think, an image of God's purity, just the level that he's on. Okay, I don't see any other hands, so I think this is a good place to um, stop the Q&A, but uh, uh, Don will be available to answer other questions you might have up front or back at the uh, book table. So let's give him a hand for that presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.